Okay, welcome everyone to the class on um, Romans. Um, thank you online students for joining us and uh, good to see our in-person students. And also thank you for our um, e-learning students who will be uh, listening to the lectures later on. Um, yesterday we began our study about on the book of Romans. So we basically looked at a brief introduction. We will continue on the introduction. Uh, we looked at um, what is um, the you know uh, the exclusiveness of Paul's uh, letter or his epistle to the church at Rome, and um, uh, uh, we looked at a brief background to uh, this epistle. Uh, you know why Paul writes this letter, to whom is he writing this letter, um, and uh, from where is he writing this um, letter, and also we. Uh, you know, we briefly looked at his um, uh, plans, travel plans, and um, uh, we also looked at, uh, you know, who started the church at Rome, okay? It was not Paul who started the church at Rome. So if it was not Paul, then um, who uh, started or established the church at Rome, okay? So um, we'll uh, continue with the introduction to the epistle uh, of Romans. Uh, we will br uh, briefly now look at uh, the key highlights of this episode. And before we do that, can uh, one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Who has the mic? Can you lead us in prayer? Nina, thank you. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this time. Father, we thank you that we are going through Romans verse by verse, Lord. We thank you for this privilege you have given us, Lord. Lord, Holy Spirit, we pray that help each one of us, Lord, to understand this. And you teach us, Lord. And we submit to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, we just looked at a brief background to this episode of, um, of Romans. Okay, now we'll just mention a key highlights or emphasis uh, uh, that has been given in this epistle or this letter. The first one is the book or the epistle of Romans. You know, uh, it gives a detail about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gospel means what? Good news. Okay. Uh, so the gospel is detailed in a very detailed way. It's given here in the epistle of Romans. So it very clearly uh, establishes or mentions um, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It mentions that we are sinners, that uh, Christ died for us, he rose again, and whoever believes in him will receive forgiveness of their sins. Okay, so this is one of the epistles where you know, um, uh, where we read or we see the, the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ is given in a very, very clear, in a very, very detailed way. And it's in a very clear and detailed way it's explained uh, in this episode. Okay. The next highlight is that, uh, you know, this episode of Romans uh, also describes our spiritual journey. Okay. So it starts with Romans chapter 1, where it brief briefly talks about the existence of God, and then in, in chapter 1 and chapter 2 talks about the sinful depravity of man. And in chapter 3 talks about the consequences of sin. Was chapter 3 and chapter 4, it talks about Jesus' work on the cross, his work of atonement on the cross, his atoning sacrifice on the cross. And um, chapter 5, he talks about justification and uh, righteousness. Uh, how we have been made righteous through grace by faith. Okay, very powerful chapter. And then chapter 6 and 7, he talks about how to overcome sin on the basis of the cross. And chapter 8, he talks about, you know, the role or the work of the Holy Spirit. So he says, hey, you know, we are dead to sin. Sin has no dominion over our lives. Sin has no uh, power over our lives. But then he says, but we find ourselves sinning. Yes or no? Yes, we find ourselves sinning. We find ourselves giving into sin. But how can we, who are made righteous, who have been justified, how can we walk in this righteousness. So he beautifully brings about the work of the 
Holy Spirit. Okay, he talks about how we can walk in the Spirit. We can walk in righteousness by the Spirit. And uh, chapters 12 to 15, he basically talks about how we can live the Christian life. So here in Romans, you will find Paul describing our spiritual journey. So if somebody reads the book of Romans, so the Paul's epistle to the church at Rome, you know, they can get easily saved. Or they can get saved because it talks about, you know, the the gospel of Jesus Christ. It talks about uh, how we can overcome sin and also teaches us how we can live our Christian life. So it's a good journey that Paul takes someone through. Okay, So it's a good book to read also if someone wants to be saved and how they can live their Christian life. Another key highlight of the book of Romans is that right, the righteousness of God is being revealed. Okay, So talk, he talks about God's uh, righteousness, his justice. And when God is just, he cannot be blamed. Okay, for his justice that he exhibits, for his justice that he brings about. Why does he bring about his justice? Because he's a righteous God. Okay, So uh, righteousness is like a major theme in the book of Romans. Okay, The word righteousness is used 36 times throughout this book. Okay. In chapters 1 and 2, Paul talks about God being the righteous judge, how he, in his righteousness, how he judges sin. Okay, And in uh, chapters 3 and 5, Paul talks about how God being righteous, you know, uh, in forgiving sin on the basis of Christ's atoning work. Okay, so God, yes, is righteous, and because of his righteousness, he's a just God, and because he's just God, he punishes sin. But why does he forgive sin? Because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And then in chapters 5, he talks about God imparting or God imputing his righteousness to the believer. So why do we, why can we go to God or why do we have that access to go before God? It's because we have been made righteous. It's not that we have been made righteous in our own strength or because of the good deeds or the good things that we have done. It's because of Christ's righteousness that has been imputed upon us, which means Christ's uh, righteousness has been, so to say, put into our account. Okay, so Christ is righteous and his righteousness has been put into our account. So like somebody puts money into your bank account and you can use it. So it's Christ's righteousness that has been accounted to us, that has been credited to um, us. Okay, so that is what he talks about, um, uh, you know, how Christ's righteousness has, that has been imparted to a believer in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 6 and 8, he talks about how um, you know a, a believer can walk right, righteously by the power of the Holy Spirit or through the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we can't live righteous lives in our own strength, in our own abilities, but we can walk in righteousness, or a believer can walk in righteousness by the work or through the work of the Holy Spirit. And this he talks about very beautifully in chapter 8, but also we can read it in chapter 6 to chapter 8. And then in chapters 12 to 15, he talks about a believer living a righteous life. Okay. Now, the whole subject or the doctrine of righteousness is not talked about in in such depth in any of uh, Paul's other epistles or any other Paul's letters like we find it here in the book of Romans. Okay, And another beautiful thing that we can see in Romans, another key highlight, is that he talks about uh, how both the Jews and the Gentiles are chosen. Okay, Now the Jews think that they are the what? Ah, they are the only chosen race. There's no one else because they have the covenants. They are they have the prophets. They theirs are the forefathers. They they have been given the laws. You know everything is. They have been given the sacrifices. They have been given the covenants. Everything has been given to them. So they are like 
the chosen race, you know, right up in the front. But then he Paul addresses the relationship between Jews and uh, Gentiles, or he's talking about, uh, you know, the uh, the the church and the Israelites. Okay. Now, why do you think he's talking about Jews and Gentiles? Why should he talk about Jews and Gentiles when there's already so much of a controversy? Why do you think he's talking about Jews and Gentiles? That both of them are chosen. Any idea? Can you take the mic, please? Yeah. So now uh, the Jews have rejected it, mm -hmm. just gone to the Gentiles. Yes. And uh, so now both are welcome. Both are equal. Yeah. Uh, both are no, no before difference. God. There's no Indeed. difference. Yes. Um, the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. Yes. And so they are also chosen by God. Anything else? Can you all listen? To, uh, can you all hear the uh, in-person students when they speak? Um, somebody can type yes or no in the chat section, please. Can somebody say something? Uh, oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So uh, why do you think he talks about Jews and Gentiles, that both of them are chosen? Yes, one reason Nina Santos said. Anything else? Ah, can take the mic, yes. Now in the church, like mm. there are both Jews and Gentiles are there. Yes. So that, that's a reason? Yes, yes, that can that is a reason, yes. So both Jews and Gentiles are in the church, okay? And, um, you know, there's a big question mark, you know, for the, the Jews and the Gentiles. And also the Jews are trying to get these Gentiles to follow some of their rituals and laws. But... Here, we basically see why he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, or he's talking about Israel and the church, because he's telling them what God is doing, okay? Because like I told you yesterday, that in the Old Testament, we basically read the history of the God's plan and purposes that he's fulfilling through the nation of Israel. It's everything is about the Israelites. But when you come to the New Testament, we come, we read about uh, Jesus, okay, we uh, read about the early church, we see how the gospel is taken to the Jews and the Gentiles, and there's no mention about the Israelites, okay, so um, uh, we see that, you know, Paul is talking about this here, and it's very interesting, okay, um, because I, I, we will uh, talk about it in, in a little bit, you know, why is he, he saying that, because, you know, uh, for the Jews, they're saying, hey, we become Christians now, we become believers, but what about Judaism? Okay, what about our uh, Jewish nation? What about those unbelievers? Okay, now when he's talking, uh, the, the Gentiles, the Gentiles saying, hey, now we have come into uh, being believers, so are we also part of the Jewish race? Are we also uh, Judaizers? Okay, are we also being part of the Jewish race? Should we follow some of the uh, Jewish customs? So that is why Paul is elaborating and he's talking about this to uh, them. Okay, now, um, so these are some of the few things that we can see as highlights, key highlights in the book of our uh, epistle to the church at Rome. Okay, now why did Paul write to the believers at Rome? Why do you think he's writing to the believers at Rome? He's not gone there. He's not seen them. He's not established a church. Uh, but why do you think he writes to them? Of course, we understand like other letters, you know, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, uh, Corinthians. He writes to them. Why? Because he's gone there. He's established a church. Okay. He's heard some reports, some problems, some difficulties. So he is writing back to address those issues. Uh, to address those topics. But why do you think he's writing to the church at Rome? When he's not gone there, when he's not seen them, he's just heard about the believers, he's not even established a church, but why he's writing? Oh, 
okay uh, uh, nina john says because it was his calling okay yes as an apostle yes anything else it was his plan it was his urge to go and meet them but okay. uh, in, then in something happened in, in between okay he plans to go and meet them yes but before that he writes to them okay maybe he writes to them because he's heard so much of the church from whom aquila and priscilla he's heard the things maybe he's heard about what are the you know difficulties the challenges that the church is facing right now when we speak about uh, our church to somebody else we speak about the positive things we speak about the good things and if there is any challenges we also speak about those challenges so paul would have heard so he maybe is he's addressing and he's writing about that okay so we see that most of his paul's epistles that he's writing is he's writing because he had a direct uh, you know connect with the church either because he's founded it or you know he's 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 exercising his spiritual oversight um, to those churches but there are two epistles that paul writes you know that he is not ex, uh, established a church there but he yet writes to these churches you know which are the two churches two places that he writes to two places that he's not founded the church but yet he writes to them one is Romans, yes. And the other one is Colossians. Okay, these are only two exceptions that Paul writes. Okay, now, um, uh, how is Paul connected to the church at Colossae and how Paul is connected to the church at Rome? Now, the church at Colossae, you know, um, and the church of Rome, he basically came to know about these churches through the leaders there. So the church at Colossae, uh, you know, he had a very strong personal relationship with Philemon, right? You know Philemon? Uh, he writes a letter to Philemon. It's a very personal letter. And in the, in the, in the letter to Philemon, you'll be studying this in the, in the next semester. He's basically writing to Philemon, asking him to take back his runaway slave. Onesimus. So a Philemon's slave, Philemon was a rich, rich man, so he had a slave. Uh, Onesimus runs away and he comes to Rome and he meets Paul and he accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and he becomes a great uh, asset to Paul in his ministry. And Paul wants to keep him because he's uh, so useful in the ministry, but Paul knows his responsibility is to send him back to Philemon. So he writes that letter to Philemon and he, he talks about a very deep personal relationship that he has. And there's a, a house church that is meeting uh, in Philemon's house, uh, which is in Colossae. Okay. So we also see that Paul had a, a good, strong relationship with Epaphras, who's also from Colossae. And we read this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, and Philemon chapter 1. There's only one chapter. So Philemon uh, chapter 1, verse 23. Okay. And um, uh, similarly, we know that Paul's relationship with uh, Rome is through the couple Aquila and Priscilla, with whom he had. Uh, worked at Corinth and also maybe he would have met other believers okay and so we see that uh, he's writing here why is he writing because I think you know Paul had this deep connect his relationship with the church at Colossae and the church at Rome because he was you know praying for these churches he was praying passionately for them look at what he says in uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 9 Okay, can somebody read Romans chapter 1, verse 9, please? Romans chapter 1, verse 9, can somebody read that loudly? For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Yeah, so he's saying, hey, I'm not simply telling you. Now, the church at Rome... We say, who is this Paul? You know, we haven't seen him. Maybe we've heard about him from Aquila and Priscilla. And uh, he's writing this letter and he's saying, hey, you know, I'm praying for you without, what does it mean? Without ceasing, without stop. The church must be wondering, who is this person? He doesn't even know us. And why is he praying for us without ceasing? But what is Paul saying before that? He's writing this not as a 
just for chumma you know essay is just likhne ke liye na he is not just writing it for the sake of writing it but he is saying who is my witness yeah he is saying god is my witness whom i serve with my spirit in the gospel that i pray for you without ceasing okay so because he is praying for that church he also longs to see that church and be with that church and to see how they are growing and also to impart to their lives and fellowship with them okay so look at uh, i want all of you to read romans chapter 1 verses 8 to 15 and also romans chapter 15 verses 22 to 24 28 to 29 and 32 and tell me some of the other reasons why paul is writing this letter to these believers romans 1 8 to 15 romans 15 22 to 24 28 to 29 and 32 so quickly read that and then you can tell me what are the other reasons why paul is writing this letter to the believers through some of the statements that he makes in these passages yes nina uh are you able to hear me oh yes very clear and loud nice thank god okay. praise god okay. yes please tell me All right. Uh, in verse nine, it says that he wants to go visit them, or he wants to come visit them, to impart spiritual gifts, okay. to be mutually encouraged, and to reap a harvest. Okay. So, uh, and also probably he wants to influence. I mean, Rome had a very special place uh, in the you know it was a kind of a seat of power for the entire Mediterranean world, mm -hmm. and so if, to have an influence of God's kingdom there. so rome would be a very important place that is one uh, i think that we kind of infer that and okay. then um, another uh, other references in scripture are also there that he, yeah he wants to influence these powerful people with the good news of salvation okay. uh, by grace through faith so that okay. is the immediate verses that i saw there will be other okay. things also yeah yes so you can continue reading and then we will uh, just look and ask maybe everyone is done reading all the passage of scripture that's mentioned then we can uh, also hear from the rest you done reading everyone if you done reading maybe you can uh, online students can uh, you know put a thumbs up in the chat section and uh, in person students can just look up so i know Romans 1:8 to 15, chapter 15, 22 to 24, 28 to 29, and 32.
dan Online students, I don't see any thumbs up. For those of you who are reading, are you still reading? Are you there in class? OK. Let's begin. So verse 9, he says, yes, he's praying for them. So he longs to, uh, you know, uh, that's why he writes this letter to them. What else? Yes, he says, I long to see you, verse 11, because I want to impart to you spiritual gifts, right? So, yeah, he wants to minister to them, correct? Sorry? Yes, verse 15 also says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are, own, who are in Rome also. Yes. Okay. He is writing this letter to believers. Because he has a long-standing desire to minister to them. He's also praying for them. What else? Why is he writing this letter? He's ready to preach the gospel to them, to impart spiritual gifts to them. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, they can also pray together with him. Yes. Okay. Verse 8, what does it say in verse 8? Ah, the faith that is spoken throughout the whole world. So he's writing because, hey, I've heard about your faith. Okay? Yeah, he wants to tell them about faith and righteousness. Okay? Also, we see that, you know, he wants, he's so passionate to share the good news of the gospel uh, to the church at Rome. Okay, what else? He's also telling, writing to them because he wants to prepare them for his visit. Yes. So he says, verse 22 of Romans chapter 15, he says, I've great desire these many years to come to you. Okay. So he's saying he's talking about his desire to visit them and he's getting them to writing this letter so that they can uh, prepare for his coming, okay, prepare the believers for his coming, okay. What else? Hmm. Yes, so he's writing to them so that, you know, he saying, hey, I'm coming to you, be ready to help me as I go on and journey on to Spain, okay. And also, he wants to, like, um, uh, what is your name? I forgot it. <laughs> Sri Radha. Sri Radha says, you know, he wants to, he wants to enjoy their company, he wants to be refreshed with them, spiritual fellowship, uh, spiritually. Uh, he wants to encourage them. He wants to be encouraged through uh, them also. Okay. What else? He was longing for these many years to see them. Yes. Thank you, Nina. Paul wrote Romans to set forth his theology in clear terms. Yes. Uh, yes, he's basically saying that, hey, I want to come and impart to you many theological truths, but this is like an introduction to that. This is like a precursor uh, to what I am going to be imparting to you. Nina John says, it, it has always been his ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, and there's no more places for him to work in these regions. Okay? Okay? Anything else? So these are some of the things why he's writing to them, just to prepare them uh, so that, you know, um, you know, when he goes and teaches them, they're already 
having a spiritual understanding so he can speak out of that. He is telling them, I'm coming, so you be prepared. He wants help from them so before he goes to Spain. So, so And also his desire to be encouraged by them and to encourage them as well. Okay. So a few things to keep in mind even as we read or study or learn about uh, the epistle to the Romans. Now, the first thing we need to keep in mind is that this book is divinely... Why does Paul, how does Paul write this book? Through the divine inspiration. Yes, the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, So it's not his revelations. It's not his truth. He is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He has received his revelations from the Lord Jesus. And that is what he is preaching and teaching or he is writing to the uh, churches. Okay. Now, uh, what uh, this is also what he has written in the other epistles. Okay. So when he's writing these revelations that he is receiving, he's writing it down in his own style and his own presentation. Okay. So it's yes, the Lord Jesus who's giving the revelations. It's the Holy Spirit who's revealing it, but writing it down in their own style and in the way that they understand in the presentation itself, okay? So what are we trying to say? We're trying to say that when we read the book of Romans, there's a lot of references to the Old Testament, yes. There's a lot of references you see to the Old Testament. And if you look, Paul always go is going back to the Old Testament to validate his points, to substantiate the truth, what he's saying. Or he's trying to logically reason with them about certain important doctrinal truths. And so he's walking them back to the Old Testament. Now, why do you think he's doing that? Mike? To confront the Jews. Yes. To confront the Jews because the Jews knew the Old Testament very, very well. They knew the covenants. They knew what God has said. They knew what God has spoken to Abraham, their, uh, their forefather. And so he's taking them back. So if you look, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, examples or validations from the uh, Old Testament. And also we see that Paul is using the Old Testament because he is also very, very well versed. He is very learned in the Old Testament. He's taught under some great Old Testament teachers, and one of them was Gamaliel. So there was even divine inspiration, there was divine revelations that he has received, but also he is using his own logical reasoning to reason out with the Jews. Because he's also a hardcore zealous Jew, right? Yes or no? Yes, he was a hardcore jealous Jew, uh, zealous Jew. He knew a lot of the Old Testament. So he is very smartly arguing from that perspective just to reason with the Jews, just for them to get an understanding of these important doctrines. And when he looked at that, he was like, wow, this is so amazing, so beautiful. You know, it's very exciting, actually. So... Uh, He's a scholar and uh, you see that, you know, even as we are studying this, we will be actually uh, chewing on some scholarly material, studying, trying to digest the scholarly material. And there's a lot of logic and reasoning, which is very, very interesting. That makes the study very interesting for us. Okay. And like I said, that uh, the Old Testament context, he uses a lot of Old Testament uh, concepts uh, in the, in his uh, uh, epistle to the Ro church at Rome. It's because, you know, he's, um, of course, he's led by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but also he is uh, trying to speak to the Jews. So he's bringing out things there uh, so that, you know, it can help the Jews understand and also it can help us who are on the other side of the cross. Okay, The Israelites, the Jews are on this side of the cross and we are on the other side of the cross. It helps us to also give us a deeper understanding, a deeper meaning of what was mentioned in the Old Testament, why God said what he said, what he, why God did what he uh, did. So when you look at all of these references, it brings about a more deeper understanding and clarity about the Old Testament. And it helps us to understand things 
in as we are in the present day church you know it helps us to understand things see things the much more uh, uh, clearer and wonderful perspective okay the other thing is also um, something that we need to keep in mind is the local context now whenever we uh, 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 interpret scripture we need to always interpret it in the context that it was written to who was it written to why was it written to what was the uh, you know the the culture there what was happening there and also we need to interpret it in the light of the rest of scripture or we need to interpret it in the light of what the person is speaking before or in the beginning of his letter or what he's already spoken in his letter in the in the in the coming chapters so it's it's important to go back and for to understand so that we can interpret it in the right way in the right context and as we'll end up misinterpreting what the author is trying to say and write okay so he's writing to the church at rome so the church at rome comprises of jewish and gentile believers now the jewish believers like i said were saying hey we accepted jesus christ what about judaism you know we've come out of are we come out of judaism do we still follow those laws do we still follow the covenant of uh, circumcision do we still follow those eating habits that we um, had and uh, we've come into christ but what about the rest of our jewish brothers what about israel Okay. Now the Gentile believers are saying, hey, we have accepted Jesus Christ. What about our Jewish brothers? Are we becoming uh, part of Judaism? You know, what is the whole dynamics? You know, what is the whole relationship? There, was, there might have been some confusion because Aquila and Priscilla would have mentioned it to Paul. So Paul is writing. Okay. So Paul is addressing both of these people and trying to help them to understand the Christian faith. That the Christian faith is righteousness through grace by faith. Okay? So it's through grace by faith. It's not by keeping covenants, certain days, certain rituals, certain sacrifices, or eating certain food. We see he mentions all of that. But it is through grace by faith. Okay? That helps us to grow in our Christian church. Another thing that we need to keep in mind is that this is a single letter. Okay. Now, for our understanding, it is broken up in chapter and verse. But if you have to look at it, it is one letter. Okay. So the chapter and verse is for our convenience, for our reference. So when it is one letter, that means there is one continuous thought flow, one continuous thought process. Okay a development development of a thought or a revelation so we need to understand what is written keeping in mind what we call as the forward and the backward look so forward and the backward look so for example if paul is writing or introducing some doctrine or some teaching in chapter one if we need to understand that better we need to build on that truth or that revelation okay we need to have a forward look that means we need to go into the rest of the other chapters of this letter and see what else he's talked about sin righteousness justification about the church and try to interpret what we read in chapter one from that perspective from that context are you understanding yes no okay so um okay so we need to have this forward look what is a backward look now if you've gone to chapter five six seven eight nine ten and we're trying to read that trying to understand then if you're reading chapter 10 we want to understand or chapter six we're understanding about sin that we are dead to sin that sin has no dominion over us to understand that we might have to go back and look at what he's already spoken about sin and also have a forward look and go forward and see what he's spoken in the in the forward chapters about sin and try to interpret and try to understand okay so that is talking about the forward and the backward look and it's important so that we stay aligned to the 
truth that Paul intends for us to understand and that he has presented here in the gospel. Okay. Um, so if we just take out scripture passages in isolation and try to interpret it, you know, we will have all the wrong ideas and we will end up misinterpreting what we are studying. Okay, so that is some of the things that we need to keep in mind, even as we are studying the book of Romans. All of you with me? Yes, you need to just persevere for six more minutes and then we are done. Okay, what to expect through the study of Romans? So what do you think you should expect from the study of Romans, from all that I have said so far? From the key highlights, what should you expect? To know more about Paul. Okay. In in his uh, in his letter, he's writing about more about himself. No, better okay. understanding of the doctrine, doctrines of the church. Uh, doctrine of what? Doctrine of truth, like Jesus Christ. Okay. What are some of the doctrines that he talks about here? I spoke Salvation, about. Salvation. Okay. Uh, righteousness, righteousness. Sin. Sin. And the Christian judgment. Values. Grace, Christian values, okay? And uh, what are the key highlights? What are the main key highlights I spoke about? This gospel, this epistle to the church at Rome talks about what in a very profound, deep way? We say by faith. Talks about the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Didn't I remember? Yes, didn't I remember I saying that this uh, this epistle? If you read, somebody can read this and be saved. Know about sin, salvation, how to live the Christian life. Okay, so what you can expect here is a clear understanding about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, um, and the, what significance that gospel has in our lives. Okay, uh, and also talks about a revelation of life. Okay, uh, transforming truths about our understanding about life and the gospel. Okay, so when we study the book of uh, Romans, uh, you know, it has some profound truths that has the power to basically challenge our understanding and to transform our life so the doctrines of the teaching of righteousness of grace of sin of salvation of the power of the cross of the work of the holy spirit can bring about a, a significant uh, you know very uh, uh, change in our thinking in our mindset in our perspective uh, in our understanding of the truth and also brings about our change and transformation in our behavior as a believer okay just imagine this powerful truth just you know hits you that hey you are dead to sin you know i don't know how many of you can take that as a fact that you are dead to sin and you say hey how can i be dead to sin i see sin reigning in my body and so paul says yeah sin reigns in your body but you're basically dead to sin Okay, and then he goes on to talk in chapter 8, what helps us to be dead to sin. So when you read some of these things, it's such profound truths that it changes your perspective. And te you tell yourself, hey, I'm dead to sin. So the sin has no longer any dominion, no longer any power, any longer any authority over my um, life. And we also see that we are recipients of God's abundant grace and righteousness and when we look that we have been righteous made righteous by god that we are the righteousness of god that will transform not only our understanding not only gives us a good perspective of the truth of who we are but also changes our relationship with god okay and we will also learn about how we will be set free from sin that sin has no longer dominion over us how to walk in the spirit how to not to be subject to the things of the flesh you know when we learn about the immeasurable love of god that nothing can separate us from the love of god romans chapter 8 then you know all of these powerful truths transform our lives how we can live our lives every day as believers how we can um, you know, all have a, a relationship of God with God is, if, uh, you know, is 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 come brings us to a, a a newer level, and also there is personal transformation that we 
receive. Okay, so all of these doctrines and all of these teachings is going to be life changing if you're going to really get into it, soak into it and let it transform your lives. Okay, so this is what happens when you study the book of Romans. So there's a personal transformation that happens to the power of the Holy Spirit. So yes, there's doctrines, there's teachings happens in the in the in the Paul in Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Uh, and some of these teachings goes beyond our intellectual knowledge, but it has the power to transform our lives. It has the power to transform the lives of the readers. Okay, So um, the purpose of this book is not merely to impart information, to lead believers in a deeper understanding of God, of his plan of redemption, salvation, but it is for believers to experience life-changing encounters with this truth. Okay, um, so Romans is uh, not only a theological masterpiece, but also it guides us into spiritual growth. It's a catalyst for personal transformation, and it uh, encourages us as believers to embrace God's grace, his righteousness, the love of God, to submit to his lordship, and to live out his gospel in our everyday lives. Okay, so when you look at God's plan of redemption that he elaborates for us in this epistle, it can be very life changing when we encounter this truth. So be um, excited and be ready to let these truths transform you and change and how you have a life changing encounter with God. Okay, we'll stop here. Uh, we'll begin with chapter one. Uh, in our next class on Tuesday. Okay, have a blessed day ahead and the rest of the week. Tomorrow is a holiday, so uh, don't uh, log in. Tomorrow is Independence Day, so happy Independence Day to all of you. Enjoy the holiday and uh, see you. Yeah, thank you.